Hi, and welcome to another Arc Daily Professionals interview. Knowing that no one builds on their own and that shaping the built environment calls for close collaboration between all the involved actors, Arc Daily has launched an initiative that recognizes and highlights the top collaborators responsible for delivering the best architecture out there. Focusing on the professionals involved in the projects we create, this strategy seeks to help our community find the right collaborator for its next architecture venture. Arcdaily is putting in the spotlight the expertise and contributions of the engineers, consultants, designers, and contractors involved in our created selection of published projects. With us today is architecture lighting design firm OVI, Office for Visual Interaction, with its founder and chief innovator, Enrique Peiniger, and we will be talking with Johannes Schaffelner, Associate Director at Zahadid Architects to understand the process of their work. My name is Kisa Haru. I'm an architect and urban designer and the managing editor at Arc Daily, and I will be your host today. Hi, Enrique. Hi, Hannes. How are you today? Hello. Good. Hello. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you for well, having us. Thank you for, uh, for um, coming on board. So basically, our conversation today will tackle in general your collaboration and in particular, the project 520 West uh, 28th in New York City and the two master plans that both of you worked on, Unicorn Island in Chengdu, China and the Al Jala Discovery Center in Charja, UAE. So are you ready to start? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you have been working together on several projects. Uh, Hannes, my first question is for you. How did this collaboration start? And what was the initial project that initiated this partnership? Um, well, there's a long-standing relationship with OVI, and Enrique can explain a bit more. It actually started way before my time in the office. Um, my uh, first um, contact was 28th Street. So 28th Street, um, the project we designed in November, December 2012, um, we were in we won the project and the the project was awarded to us in, in January 2013. That's also the time when we set up the team. And uh, OVI was a, was a, a very obvious choice because of the track record with the office, but also because they have a headquarter in New York. And, and Enrique can elaborate a bit more about the history and connection to the office. Yeah, well, our collaboration with the office already goes a little back. I think it was approximately in 98, we were working on the Scottish Parliament at the time with Enrique Morales, and we were traveling always to Edinburgh every three weeks. Mm. And we are coming uh, through London, uh, always connecting to Edinburgh, and I contacted Zaha Hadid, actually, and it was very, we were very fortunate. Zaha Hadid's office just won the commission for the Cincinnati Art Center. It was, and I called her up and said, well, I work with light designer. She said, no. Uh, and then was, I introduced ourselves and at the time, to be honest, we didn't have a track record at OBI. We were a brand new firm. We established ourselves. And then Zaha was, of course, skeptical. It was unique. Going to studio, the only paintings, everything. So it was unique. The studio was super cool. Uh, and I could see this unique energy there. So uh, then we discussed, well, we want to work with you. Test us. So uh, she said, oh, I'm working right now on competitions. Do you want to join us? I said, oh, sure. Uh, and then we did on one weekend, we did three competitions. It was a ski jump in Innsbruck, the ferry station in Salerno, and the Fano Science Center. And all three competitions, we won together. It was very unique. This was a moment. We were in their office when they were transforming from from being an artist with exhibition at the MoMA and so on into uh, an architect. So it was very unique. And since then we started working and we continued this co collaboration since then. Hmm. And with Hannes, you explained how we came together on the West 38th Street project. Yeah. Do you want to explain to us, uh, Johannes, how it started with 28th Street? Yeah, with 28th Street, while well, we formed a team in 2013, and um, and um, we start straight away. It was a very fast process, and uh, so we had we had great um, we had great collaborators on board, and OVI was one of them. And uh, there was immediately a chemistry and energy, and and really a dynamic uh, kind of conversation, not only about architecture, but more what what goals do you have on the project. So that was very inspiring, and also. I think was then the starting point for many more projects. Enrique, before we um, talk more about this specific project, 
I have a question for you. As a lighting designer, how would you describe your role in the creative architecture process? And basically, how much flexibility and compromise do you require from the other parties? Since we're talking about uh, all of your uh, uh, collaborations with the Hadid architects. So first of all, there's no formula. <laughs> there's no real formula. The point is, um, the creative process is very, actually for us, it's really, I always try to use a metaphor. Actually, the architecture is like a film and every film is different. And we are preparing the film music. When you go to a good movie, you walk out and you're mesmerized of the movie, of the action, what happened there. But you should never remember what the film music was about. Then the music is too loud. So it's really for us in always to set the moods and enhance the moods that finishes, all these things, we want to enhance it. But we would like to be the perfect collaborator. Actually, we understand ourselves like an extended team member. Really that we have to think we have to think about it. When we sit here, let's make a this way. If we sit here and we think about what can we do for West 28th Street, we think, okay, if Hannes would be here, what would he decide if he is with our expertise working on this project? That's how we think about the project. It's not that we think, okay, we want to do this or that. It's not about compromising. It's about discovering new solutions, giving suggestions and engage in dialogue, inspire up a dialogue. And Hannes said it, we always ask ourselves, what is it in itself? What is important to this project? The important is, there's so many good ideas. What is the key ideas to make a project stronger? Actually, it shouldn't be a hot pot of everything. Actually, it's a unique idea. That is always an important part in translating the unique idea into different layers that you can feel. It's not adding ideas and more noise. It's actually really stay to the core of the project. And that's really important for us always. So we really try to be really summarizing. We have two cultural contexts. The architect is one cultural context. What is really the culture of Zahadi? What is then the vision of the architect? What Hannes envisioned? What his team envisioned? What are your ideas? And the cultural context of the project. When a project is in New York, West 28th, what is unique to this project? What is the right thing to, as a response to West 28th and the highlight? And Hannes, you can speak very good to the highline, of course. You are the expert mm. for that. So, so let's talk then about West 28th uh, Street, since we're bringing this up. Uh, Hannes, the building is located as this, uh, at the start of one of New York's uh, most important public spaces, which is the High Line, just like Enrique just mentioned. So what was uh, the initial design intention and how do you think OVI helped to achieve this? Yeah. So, I mean, I need to go back a bit and explain a bit the history of the site. The, so the Highland was, um, you know, there was, it was used for trains to bring food into the city. Then uh, there was 1930s in the 70s, um, trucks were like replacing that. And, and basically the, the Highland become redundant. In 2006, then the city de decided to change it to, um, to a landscape park. Um, at that time, it was still very industrial and a lot of industrial sheds along the Highline. Only then the whole 2006, the whole dynamic changed and and the uh, property started to flourish. So our design is very much reflecting the kind of ethos and, and kind of industrial feel of the surrounding. And we continue this in our building. Very much you see it on this very handcrafted facade, which was done in Philadelphia, beautiful job, um, all in stainless steel, a very industrial feel and, and carries the character of the surrounding. And um, with the light uh, concept we did for the exterior, we did the same um, during nighttime, like during the day, the, the Highland is actually very busy, but then during night this closes and it's becoming very quiet. So the concept is also to kind of continue the silence of the nighttime. And, um, and the concept for the exterior is really that the architecture speaks for itself and the, the stainless steel picks up reflections on the facade and the light concept is actually very muted. And the, the focus is really on the interior and public spaces. Well, it's an iconic building and uh, uh, maybe Enrique can help us with this. How do you think lighting contributed to the status of this building of actually also making it iconic uh, in its location? Well, actually, um, we did a lot of lighting studies. What can be done for exterior? We studied the surrounding, we looked at the building. At the end, we discussed this, of course, with Hannes and his team. And at the end, it's also about editing. What, 
How does something age? How does it look in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? It should be really timeless. It's not a piece which is going to be refurbished in three years. It's not a store. So actually, how can we give the right texture to it? It writes right pristine. And it's like an artifact, a modern artifact. And that's the reason we felt actually it's a residential building. Any, adding any lighting make it too commercial looking too it takes away from the pristine because with ambient glow from the from the from the surrounding city already so it looks actually more elegant with a little bit less light and that's when we didn't add lighting to the facade so it's really sometimes it's really important as excited we are as light designers editing <laughs> it's really the point is uh, actually make it elegant you shouldn't see a light designer was working on job it should be natural to the project but the natural extension of the architecture. And that was actually the whole idea about it, uh, that people feel comfortable in residence. It's not a it's not a public uh, space there. It's a private residence and it's a very unique residence, but we have to respect also the needs of the user inside and when they engage in this building. So that's something, it's a it's a delicate balance in all of us to do that. Although we, we like to talk to each other, Hannes and I and the team, we have, we have a lot of fun working, but we have to also restrain ourselves. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so in this case, the program was at the center of, uh, let's say, the conceptual approach. Um, but what are the technical challenges and opportunity uh, opportunities that the complexity of the shapes brought to the table, uh, Enrique, since we're talking more about lighting in this case? Actually, uh, some areas, actually, uh, there are a lot of interior areas which do quite a lot of uh, attention. Hannes, you remember the... Uh, public areas, uh, public areas like a spa and these things. So is it something really where lighting, you select very careful your materials and we find it what we need to enhance the moods, which Zaha envisioned for the interiors. And so uh, we discussed with uh, Hannes and his team, mood boards and actually experience of, of interiors. And this is something where lighting should shift actually what is the afternoon mood in, a, in the spa, in the evening mood, in the weekend mood. So that's something we really want to enhance that will feel really tranquil, then and that's something which is really important that people can really feel in a in a workout area it's different mood and from a from, from, from the uh, in the gym it's different mood from the spa so that's something really important that lighting can really enhance the moods yeah and um i and um, jonas you just talked about bringing silence uh, inside since it's a res residential uh, building uh, on a very let's say busy during the day uh, part um, but you have created a huge glass facades, you know. How did you manage mm. to create privacy and how did lighting basically contribute to this, especially at night, you know? Good question. Um, well, there is, uh, during the day, uh, the glass um, has a certain amount of reflection and gives privacy for the residents. But at night, you're right, it, it kind of reverses and the interior space is very visible. But uh, as I said before, the highline is also closed, and and the highline and the um, it becomes almost like the backyard of those buildings, and it's okay. it's very private. Mm -hmm. um, but and we did a lot of studies during uh, doing concept and schematic in different ways, like um, through renderings, but also art pieces, uh, even like relief models. And um, what we often do is really we want to continue. The exterior design into the interiors. That's also what we, we wanted to achieve here. Um, we also technically, we have uh, curtains who, put, uh, who give privacy, but mainly it's also about choosing the location of the units. So we have uh, towards the highlands, obviously there's less privacy, but if you go higher, more, and then if you, you choose the units served by the West Core, which is away from the highland to the north and to the south, there is more privacy. But mm -hmm. uh, it also raises an interesting question. What is privacy in the 21st century when there are people who are sharing basically their whole lives on social media? And, <laughs> and so, so, the, so the answer is maybe whoever people, like residents feel comfortable, they choose more privacy or less. Um, so it's up to them. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> and speaking about residential programs, um, such as, as West 28, um, what do you, what both of you do, uh, what uh, are the key elements for comfort and design and lighting, in your opinion? Can you repeat the question, please? I didn't hear it. Okay. So 
especially in residential programs, what do you think are the key elements for comfort in design and lighting in general, not just in uh, West 28? Actually, um, for the residential program, key element for lighting, I think it's interior finishes. <laughs> I think space, interior finish. So I think nearly it's a, a, it's it cannot be lighting alone. <laughs> what is it if you look at this material? You look how 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 the lighting is shoving around. Actually, it's a it's a materiality. It's a materiality mm -hmm. which is actually sending giving the tone. Coming back to the metaphor of film music, a soundtrack without a film doesn't have a meaning. It's only a music. But actually, it's it sets a mood when you walk into the elevator core and you can see how the material is being really shaped and twisted, how architecture is twisting, and, and, and then the light we follow is in curvature. So for us, it's actually, if there's a recipe, if I have to look for a recipe, not using too much light, tune the light exactly, because if there's a twisted element, for example, and you put too much lighting on the element, it becomes flat. It should be articulated, and that's something that's important. If it's too much, it looks like a uh, it looks like a mall, and that's actually for interiors. It has to set moods. It, we have to consider also people have different different moods sometimes. When you are on on your device uh, online, you do have different moods, and you are in the evening uh, watching a movie or something like this. We have to we have to really accommodate for different needs when somebody wants to do, have certain activities. When you have a friend, only two friends over, it's different atmosphere. When you host a dinner party with six people, so we have to accommodate different needs. That's something really important. So. Uh, we have to be really looking materials and space. That's so comfort. Comes. So comfort comes according to you from moods, materials, and spaces. And comfort should not be perceived. <laughs> it should be natural fit. That's important. That's why we worked with uh, OVI very intensely on the interior. Um, if I can just add, like for Twenty Eighth Street, so we, we created like these different mood boards. We have different areas. Um, we call them material groups. Uh, the first one is the lobby and the event space, which are very public and bright and white. Um, so um, they're the most public spaces. But then when you go to, down with the staircase, uh, you come to the amenities areas, which is the spa, the gym, uh, and the pool area, which is very much in stone and blue tones. So that was our, that's like um, already a more private area and the most private areas are then the vestibules, elevators, and viewing rooms, uh, which we then have champagne color with very dimmed lights, where residents are mainly alone. Um, and then the units, basically, the units were a long discussion with the clients, but they're kept quite neutral, even though we did a lot of design. We designed um, like a bespoke Millworth work piece, which divides the kitchen from the living rooms and also the bathrooms which are kept mainly in, in black and white, but uh, the units are also quite neutral and even and also sort of the lighting. I mean, then we had spotlights, cove lights, um, but there are also like outlets for residents to design it the way they want. It's a, it's a tricky balance <laughs> uh, living in a Zahadit designed house because on one hand, you won't have character. On the other hand, you should have enough space that the potential uh, resident can fill in into his into this space he doesn't feel overwhelmed so it's a very it's it's a very quick it's a very it's not a white box <laughs> they have that really there's character to space in a good way so there's an expression to the space but it shouldn't be overwhelming that you get so this was really interesting and so lighting is also supported that people can find themselves in there so it's mm -hmm. can us can find himself as somebody as somebody else so uh, different people uh, different users so it's a balance uh, mostly yeah, it should speak to them. Yeah, moving... it was a long discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now moving a bit to a larger scale, because both of you also worked on master plans. Um, Hannes, um, what what do you think? Uh, basically, what are the know hows and features that you're able to take from the building scale to a master plan scale? Yeah, it's certainly a very different approach um, but in some ways also similar um, when it comes to like a building we very much work with the surrounding and how it affects uh, the building design when it comes to master plan it's in much more about uh, the relationship be between one building and the other and much more about designing the in-between space the public space so for uh, Al Jada master plan and and unicorn we both master plans have a similar pattern which is it radiates out 
and um, forms a constellation of buildings. We create, create a dynamic composition of architectural volumes across the site, and it's really it's embedded in this beautiful landscape. So the landscape is a in the public space is a very important feature, which is kind of the canvas and the backdrop for for all the activities for residents, for um, you know people who are working there or going shopping and so on. So so it's really about the community and and um, and the people um, when you design master plans. And that's also when when working with OVI, there's a lot of discussions about public space and activities along uh, you know along these activities and the master plan yeah we will get to public spaces because it's a i think it's a very important topic um but first enrique can you walk us through your conceptual approach for the unicorn uh, island in Chengdu in china um and can that can we talk about uh, like what are the key elements that brought design lighting and engaged all different sensations well, uh, of course, it's a large project. Let's not get distracted by size. Let's connect the dots to West 28th Street. West 28th Street was a single building, and the backyard, how Hannes said, was actually the high line. So there's a configuration of two elements. If you think about the master plan for uh, Unicorn Island, we added these configurations in different situations together. So that is a little bit uh, how we approached it. Actually, it was really interesting to work with the uh, Hadi team uh, uh, because actually we discussed what is a metaphor, what, what this project is about. And we settled on a metaphor of a coral reef. A coral reef has a metaphor of different ecosystems working together. They are so close sometimes, they live it away, but it's a coral reef. It works together as a whole and everything together has a whole little ecosystem. And the little ecosystem can be compared like low, small social group, uh, placemaking, but it has to work in a smaller uh, segment for one building and also for two buildings and four buildings. So the space can fluctuate in a parametric understanding. And this was something really important for Unicorn Island that we don't think in a grid, we don't think in square feet or square meters or in volumes. That's not how it is. Actually, a Unicorn Island is an, let's think about it, an organism which can adapt in different sizes. For smaller groups, when there's some event on the plaza or big event on the plaza, it should feel always right to the group. And that's something important. It should feel natural. And it's for us important, it should, uh, the, the concept for us is always cultural context. That is really what is the right solution, the, uh, the, the coral reef in, the, in China, in Chengdu, Unicorn Island. That is actually a, a society for the 21st century. What are their needs? Hannes, you mentioned actually social media before. <laughs> How can we adapt to something like this without being trendy that we only lock into the current social media? How can we de generate public spaces which are which are comfortable for grandma and for the next generation. So we have to bridge these elements. It should be not only a city for a certain user group. It's a city for a lot of different users. So that's something really important. And we spend a lot of time to think about it. What is the right uh, element? And it's it's not that we study books. We have to actually speak, engage, and test, and, uh, and, and, and toss up ideas and find solutions and inventive solutions. There's no template for that. That's what he has done as total new. And this is actually mm -hmm. something which is actually a, a very unique challenge. Mm, Hannes, I know that uh, you spend a lot of time uh, uh, researching materials, especially for Unicorn Island um, in Chengdu. Uh, how did you manage to create or find basically materials that serve your um, creative ideas and also, um, uh, I would say, the, the lighting approach? Enrique already touched base on, on this topic. So how we did it really is like the, the overall master plan needed to look coherent. As Enrique explained, we used the, the reference of a coral reef to create like mm -hmm. a, a contemporary city of the 21st century. Um, and um, so also in design wise, first of all, we needed to create neighborhoods, which are different. So when you have office, or residential, they feel different and they should be different materials. Um, so more, we're using more metal for office and then more natural materials for residential, but also the color uh, mood is different. But then it's not that it's like, uh, it should not look like a collage. It needs to always be designed in clusters of families of buildings. And then the material needs to, um, you know, come from one building to the other. So 
what we did is actually we, we cut we cut slices of each building from for the whole all the 24 buildings of the master plan and then looked how one material or one pattern of the facade is connected to the next so like a natural organism it's it's not like a copy paste or a collage of buildings it's really um, a, a coherent atmosphere of the whole master plan that was important to us and required a lot of studies and and careful design and it was like a small like uh, and this logic also like went uh, to actually create the whole master plan right there was uh, basically we worked through the whole master plan and uh, the whole storyboard was actually evolved with with the input from ovi there was a lot of mm. like uh, work sessions where we spin the ideas what it could be and 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 basically build up um, a kind of storyboard um, for for this island and for the public space that, because it needs to be diverse enough, but it also um, it needs to be coherent. So and since you not a yes. cutter approach, it's really what unique is actually about it is it should be. We always love the European cities because they're grown in layers. And it's not a typical, uh, it's not a salami. You add on more square footage to get a bigger city. That is how the European city, uh, how layers of culture and layers of history are built. And that's actually what these, what Hannes is describing in a nice way, that these edits, uh, these layers which are nearly interlocking and the placemaking, which and that you have different fields of placemaking. And this makes it that you have different neighborhoods which really speak to each other. And that's really very mm. unique. Yeah. And the since you're talking about public spaces, uh, Enrique, can you tell us a bit more also about like the role of lighting uh, and the public spaces that you're doing in these different master plans? Like you talked about having like uh, a field to a neighborhood, but how basically can lighting design, I don't want to say define places, but uh, also like draw these places, you know, like create this mood? Yeah, but it's, it's, the trick is, you shouldn't notice the lighting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all about the. Uh, it's all about the. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, Unicorn Island, it's about the, the vertical elements are the facades. So facades define the plazas. So it's all about how the how the how the facades speak are tilted or tilted away from the plaza. Uh, uh, how these things are element done. So the point is, we don't want to have typical easy solution. Computers suggest you put some poles up and you have the light levels. This is something comfortable. This is like a soccer field. <laughs> you feel an uh, interrogation. That doesn't feel comfortable. So it's really important about placemaking that there is also use of darkness in a good way. <laughs> it's, it's something is nice that you have a focal point. What's important to the place? It's always, we always look at it, what defines this place in a unique way? What's the character of it? How can we articulate that? So that's something important that there's a nice backdrop, that you have focal point and you have a foreground, middle ground, background. That's something really important uh, that people feel that is a comfortable space that is actually intuitive wayfinding. We don't want to see everywhere like on the airport signs, go here, go here. It should be mm. intuitive. It's something where architecture is helping because if there's a unique building, which is an anchor point, this anchor point can be said, okay, we meet at this building. This uh, It has a certain maybe nickname or something like this because there's a certain design and that's something helpful. So we don't need actually big billboards saying, well, we meet under the big, big biggest billboard on the, on the plaza. That's not what you want to have <laughs> because this feels only commercial. There's always a bigger billboard, but not a nicer building. We look for the nice buildings. So it's really something important about that. We have also to understand that actually there are different activities in the afternoon when the family goes there with, a, with their two kids, they have different needs than a group when there's a rock concert. <laughs> so we have to adapt to these elements. So it's something really important. We speak to the to Hannes uh, and his team always, uh, what are the different needs? What's your idea about that? How can we accommodate this? How can we do, do something which is comfortable, but we take this a step forward in the next, uh, in the next reference. That's something really important. Mm. Unique challenge, challenge was uh, what we discussed on Unicorn was actually that we have two public areas. We have a public mm -hmm. area, which is the main plaza, and we have a lower area, which was actually, uh, which is actually uh, below, not below ground, but there is a, but there's a lower, lower lobby area, a lower big space. How to have actually not a secondary layer, actually that both layers, top uh, ground floor and below floor, the lower floor have actually quality of space. That's where daylight comes in. Mm -hmm. Daylight is super unique because 
For us, it has to feel really, really natural. It should be not something that it feels artificial. It should put natural also out of the extension what the what the HD team is using uh, what is using for. And actually, we use actually to interface with our D team Rhino, Grasshopper, and plugin of Ladybug, really to exchange three D models, which really speaks to the architecture and work in a technical way. But in a, we have to give early input that this can also infuse their design design process and not afterwards. And very important for us for daylighting, it shouldn't be technical prepared. The information we prepare should be prepared in a way that it's usable for architects. Too often daylighting is misused as a technical tool and there's so much design opportunity to it. And it's, it's, it's free, it's sustainable and it makes the space more unique. That's something very nice. When you're in the lower areas, you have a sense of time because the passing of the sun. And that's something nice. We don't want to artificial light with the same all the time. The passing of sun is a nice element to experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we are talking about uh, Unicorn Island, what would be uh, the special features uh, that we can find in Aljada Discovery Center in Sharjah? I don't know if Enrico uh, wants to take that. Question, please, for who do we address? Can you repeat the sentence, please? Yeah, yeah I'm, um, I'm saying that since we are talking about like the specificities in Unicorn Island, like uh, the public space specificities, what would be the features in Aljala Discovery Center in Sharjah? In, uh, actually, in this project, actually, it's a configuration of different neighborhoods. That is something very unique because it's a very residential driven neighborhood uh, which is surrounding the building. So it's really important to have actually opportunity of different uh, places which have offered different quality of space, which is actually, uh, Hannes, you had just an opening three weeks ago uh, uh, over yeah. there. And actually you had big, uh, there were big talks. There was, uh, there was nearly a festival out there. So how do we accommodate? We could anticipate these kind of events. How can you anticipate these kinds of events mm -hmm. at the same time allow skateboard? <laughs> and these in, in Al Jada, it's important. The active life is during nighttime. So how do mm -hmm. we, how can we simulate nearly sun, uh, 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 moonlight? That you don't have, it's not flat light, but moonlight, that you have filtered light, something that feels comfortable, and that, that you have enough light that you can walk around, families feel, feel secure, and that's something important for us. Hannes, do you want to add anything about the Al Jada master plan? Yeah, Al Jada, I mean, we worked uh, on, the, on the overall master plan also with OVI. We completed one building, which, uh, as Enrique mentioned, we just opened it. Mm -hmm. Um, it turned out to be really nice. Also, the whole um, it's it's not a very loud building. It's very much about the integration into the landscape. There is kids playgrounds. Um, there is skate parks. Um, there's all kinds of activities. So it's it's really about the community. Um, and and so what the interior of the the design really continues into the landscape and it becomes one. The building itself is more like a meeting hub. Um, it's it's a sales center for uh, for the residential units which are around the master plan, but it becomes really a social hub. And, and at nighttime, it's really nice when the kids come out and play at the playground or the, the, some uh, some you know kids are skating, and it's, it's super active. Um, and we just we, we flew in like uh, I think 300 people of staff came to 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 Dubai, and uh, we had events in in three different. Uh, buildings and one of them um, was at Al Jada Discovery Center, which was very successful. And and we had did a couple of talks there. We had a because was design week, and uh, so the lighting concept is is really successful. And the nice thing is really how how the building kind of is embedded in the landscape and how it continues activating the public space. It's very interesting that uh, notions of placemaking, community, and intuition are coming uh, in this conversation when we're talking about lighting and about architecture. Um, and my final question for both of you is, how, uh, what would be the general key features for successful collaboration, in your opinions, based on your uh, long uh, experience? Well, well uh, with like working with OVI is obviously, it's a very uh, creative and collaborative process. Um, it doesn't feel like you're working with, like, it's just a typical consultant. They're really more of 
the extension of our team with just a very different and diverse skill sets, which is great to have sometimes a different you know, pers perspective and the conversations are much richer. And um, it's, it's really not so much to find only a light solutions, especially in master plans. It's more to define key criteria um, and for, for each project. And um, so, I mean, I feel a certain amount of privilege in my position as a did architect, being part of a, a global renovate center of design innovation. Um, it creates a, a lot of opportunities. And uh, and during my 17 years at Saadit, I met like a lot of amazing people who push the boundaries of innovation in different fields. And um, so OVI and Enrique is full of energy, and and they, and and it's certainly part of that group. So I, I'm very fortunate to to have worked with them for such a long time. Thank you, Hannes. It only works because you're open-minded. That's really for us a key feature. You don't have this preset agenda and that what you should be delivered. Actually, it's uh, sometimes misunderstood because you're such a recognized architect uh, around the world, but actually you guys are doing the design process so open-minded. So listening, you listen, we share the same values, you're open, oh, can we think this, this or this? And then these options get, get uh, evaluate it and we find something new out of it and that's unique that actually we share the same values we it's a flexible open dialogue and that's really mm -hmm. something which makes really good and what uh, we really enjoy also with you is actually a uh, degree of success is it's all about innovation what's the next step <laughs> it's not to be different what makes sense and the unique thing about uh Zahadid, there's always a hidden logic to every project it looks these curves look random there's always a there's always a reason behind why something is done, and to unlocking this hidden logic and transforming it into lighting. That lighting is not something like this. Lighting has to be a natural extension to it, and that's something really unique. And that's what I mean with shared values and these things. And this is mm. really something very uh, uh, challenging for us because. The computer doesn't suggest this. What is, what is there? The computer makes studies, but actually we use different tools. But that is a collaborative process, which is really engaging and it's really infusing. That's really a very fun process for us. And it, I have to say it changed over many, many years. That's mm. actually the interesting part about it. It started all back in with our did herself. But this process always continues. So we talk about now placemaking and we talk about what is the, uh, you talked about Instagram media. How can how can we, in meta space, how can we be part of this and supporting it? So that's something unique challenges. So it's always evolving. Yeah, I think that's how Saha taught us to, I mean, she was evolving already a lot during her lifetime. Uh, in her style and 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 whatever we submitted one week it was already old the week after, so it's always finding trying to find something new and 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 it's never enough. Uh, but Hannes, uh, so... be careful! It's not a trend because the funny thing about Zaha projects they don't age. When you look at Cincinnati, it still looks good today. There are other projects which are actually, actually Zaha, your office has a has an antenna for it that there is something. It's so tasteful that it's more than classic right away. <laughs> and that's always what, what the idea behind is. Mm. And that's how we ask ourselves, is it the facade of West 28? Is the light solution we would choose also good in 5, 10, 15 years? And should we not 20 years look this what we did? This we did actually 10 years ago. Now we do that. that we don't want to do that. It's all modern classics. Enrique, Hannes, thank you so much for this uh, eye-opening conversation. And would you like to add yeah. anything else uh, to, do you want to say anything else to our audience who are listening and like, uh, who are like basically understanding more how collaborative work, uh, mm -hmm. how, how collaborative uh, uh, your partnership is basically? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I think it's great what you guys are doing that you invite, uh, it's a bit like behind the scenes, because yeah, architecture is a collaborative effort that there's, there's a lot to pull together to, to push something through. It's never like a one man show. And um, to kind of, I think through the talks, hopefully this comes across a bit more. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it, thank you very much for inviting us and hopefully we could, some insights of how we work and uh, 
um, and hopefully we're going to have a talk in, in the future of many more projects. <laughs> Actually, if I can add to that, I come, of course, uh, sorry, I come from a little bit from the lighting perspective. I would like to pledge my colleagues, don't get caught up too much in the watts per square meter in optimizing facade for daylighting, 3% more. This 3% more or 2% more, vandalize the architecture. <laughs> Take it one or two notches down. It's uh, If the architecture is more enhanced, it's more pleasing in the long term. I think too often engineers cannot stop themselves. They continue to design and uh, optimize it to a point that this light, the solution looks foreign. A daylighting suit looks too foreign. It should come natural. We under, we think sometimes of ourselves. Is Hannes is writing a chapter about a project uh, uh, of Unicorn Island about daylighting, and we write one sentence. You shouldn't see a different handwriting. It should be the same handwriting. And engineers put always an optimization factor in which vendor it pushes too hard. So that's something we really it is our optimized what we do. So let's take it reasonable. And Thank I didn't you, talk Enrique. about the speed, the sustainability, that's all part of it. But let's not yeah. get caught up in this. Because if a, if a facade is beautiful architecture, we cannot, uh, or it's ugly, we say, but it's very good in lead. No. So mm -hmm. we, we are happy with that. It's not working. <laughs> it must be beautiful at the same time. It's like a Porsche. It's a good car. At the same time, it's high performance. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful metaphor. <laughs> Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Hannes.